It's such a beautiful day out here. The air is alive with birdsong and the gentle bubbling of nearby brooks. There are ancient oak trees everywhere, reaching up into the sky and forming a dense canopy. The occasional shaft of light spears through amongst the leaves, illuminating the lush green moss on the ground below, as soft and perfect underfoot as a brand new rug. This might seem like we're just having a pleasant jaunt through a local forest here at SCP Explain, but take a closer look at the trees. This isn't just any forest, dear viewers. That's right. After years of attempted espionage and infiltration, we are here at long last. The Wanderer's Library, the limitless interdimensional archive of all knowledge in the multiverse often frequented by the serpent's hand via portals known as the Ways. Who would have guessed that the secret to getting inside was just asking very politely and promising not to steal any of the books? We should just try being nice more often. But hey, as the dispensers of user-friendly animated knowledge here on YouTube, we felt that we ought to share this bounty of limitless knowledge with you. The wing of the Wanderer's Library we're seeing right now is known as the Hidden Nest. It's a good starting point for new scholars perusing the boundless texts available beyond dimensions. How about we begin with this collection over here, King Shosh's Shelf. Try saying that three times fast. And then take a look at the inscription above the case. The Lord of the Lazy. His kingdom is anywhere in which sloth reigns above activity in the hearts of all those devote to lounging over labor. He and his secret army wage a war against all doers, a battle for the universe that can only end in the cessation of all motion in the universe, or total unstoppable chaos. Lord of the Lazy, hmm? Sounds like me when I clock off for the weekend. Let's crack the spines on a few of these dusty old volumes and take a look inside. First, we have On the Common Vampire, an extract from the thought-to-be-lost St. Emile's Bestiary, translated into English by the famed scholar of the anomalous known as Rounder House. It is an indispensable source of knowledge for those who are aware of, and rightly fear, the vampires that lurk in the dark all around us. It goes into great detail about the biology of the common vampire, also known as Vampire Draculae, and believed to be the progenitor to all other vampire species, as well as their diet, behavior, and the best methods of hunting them. The following is a brief extract. Vampire Draculae is largely similar in shape and form to Homo sapiens sapiens, an erect biped with a wingspan roughly equivalent to its height. The most obvious feature discerning them from a human is the shape of their hands. The vampire's hands are claw-like, with long, hard nails extending up to two centimeters, often sharpened to a point. The muscles in these hands are taut and powerful. They can be quickly contracted to exert immense pressure on anything in the vampire's grasp. This ability is commonly used to crush the skulls or bones of prey. Naturally, the vampire's teeth are the second source of notability. The fangs of a vampire are stuff of legend, and it is difficult to extricate myth from fact. Dissection of the adult specimens have noted sexual dimorphism in the dental region. While males have two score and eight teeth to the females two score, they are less dangerous. Four of the males can be described as fangs, both front-facing, two on the top and two on the bottom, each a centimeter above the gum line. Comparatively, females have eight fangs, four on the front and two on each side. Her front fangs are up to one and a half centimeter above the gum line. The legends have preserved one important bit of truth regarding the fangs. They are used almost exclusively to suck blood from the vampire's prey. They bite into the flesh, most often of the neck or thigh, and the vampire uses its lips to create a seal around the incisions before sucking. However, study of their feeding habits has led me to an intriguing discovery. As soon as the bee separates itself from its prey, its saliva soothes the wound and encourages faster clotting. While this is pure speculation, your author theorizes that this is an adaptation to preserve the life of the prey in order to remain a consistent food source. A truly fascinating piece of technical literature. Next, of course, there is the short but haunting piece titled Leavings of Another World. 
written by the great thinker Jack Manganese. This tome carries an important lesson to all who wander through the hallowed halls of the Wanderer's Library, about the power of words. But it's not the kind of power you might think. Allow this extract to expand on that. Words have power. Indeed, they have the power to create, but mostly they have the power to destroy. Does that really surprise you? Let me demonstrate. Please think of an animal, any animal. It could be anything, right? Two-legged, four-legged, wings, anything. But now suppose I said, think of a quadruped. It can no longer be two-legged, can it? It can no longer be a bird or a fish. And if I said, think of a black domesticated feline, your choices are narrower still. And finally, think of Bastet, my pet black cat. At that point, you have no choices at all. You may believe that each step gives you more information, but what it really does is limit your imagination and destroy possibilities. The power to destroy you see is much greater than the power to create. You didn't notice because you, yourself, are a creature of thoughts, ideas, language, and ultimately, of words. Suppose I told you there was once a world without language, without ideas, without words. Of course, world itself is a word, so it wasn't really a world, but we have to call it something now, don't we? In this world, there were no limitations. Everything that could be, was. Everything that couldn't be, also was. It was a vast place of infinite complexity, but also of infinite simplicity. Since everything that was or wasn't also was or wasn't everything else, the endless variety was, in fact, all the same. You say it's difficult to describe? Indeed, that's the point. It can't be described. It was everything and anything and something and nothing, and all at once and not at all. What happened to it? Words, of course. It started with a single simple word, in a language that no one speaks anymore. No one knows where it came from or how it sounded, but I'll tell you what it meant. It meant red. And as soon as there was red, there was also not red. The world had been neatly cloven into red any every somethings and not red any every somethings. It was the first division, and the very idea of division spawned more ideas and more words. One, two, separate, together, us, them, and from these came more, many, many more. The piece then goes on to reveal that the proliferation of language destroyed this world further, until all that was left was the wreckage, our world. How a universe of infinite possibilities is slowly dulled by the ever-expanding power of nomenclature. Truly a disturbing thought for the more metaphysical among you. Let's take another book from King Shash's collection. Next comes a frightening parable about hubris from the Bard, known as Jack of Trades. Like many a classic parable, this piece tells the tale of an intelligent spider, a Jack of Trades, as the story puts it, whose arrogance forges him into the architect of his own demise. Let's take a look at an extract, shall we? I once met a spider named Jack. A sizable fellow he was, the size of my fist and eight legs as long as my hand. They were dexterous too, complimenting his keen mind. That was where his name came from. Jack of Trades, for with each leg he would conduct each of his trades. With one he was a blacksmith, forging steel like silk, that with another he would spin into death traps. With a third he would contemplate the design of his web, for he was an architect, with the fourth, he would climb the tallest of trees and bask in the daylight, so that all would see his splendor and in it take delight. Oh yes, he was proud. Why wouldn't he be? He was the most talented spider to have ever graced the land, his crafts as numerous as they were grand. I don't just weave webs, he said to me. I weave works of art, my traps instruments of death so much finer than all the rest. Then one day, Jack hatched a plan. Up the tallest of trees he climbed. He did not rest for two nights and two days until he reached the highest branch. The words some proclaim say he could touch the moon up there, but I digress. For one thing was certain. The height he had reached was a thing to impress. 
What Jack did next was more August still. Working each of his renowned legs, he weaved a web from the base of the branch to its end. So mighty in scale was it that he said it would catch him the sun and make him master of all that it touched. It will bring me the moon too, he told me once, and with the light of the brightest star I shall be master of the night. Catch them he did, for as the sun climbed it found itself twined in the mesh of Jack's web. As for the moon, it soon found itself strewn with Jack's string, which clung to its opalescent veneer as it drew near to its ever-evasive lover, the bringer of day. Now they were tied to one another in Jack's trap for him to reign over. It was thus he crafted himself a throne of sunlight and moonlight, the very heavens made to bow before his majesty. Yet, it was not to last. The rest of the tale details the downfall of Jack the Spider, as he devours the sun and moon above, driven by his boundless hunger for greatness. Soon enough he was left with nothing to consume, and in his despair, tumbled from his web down to his doom. So is often the way with those pushed by unchecked ambition. Time to blow the dust off of another one of the library's forbidden texts. This one, entitled A Restless Wanderer on the Earth, is a particularly interesting piece for anyone fascinated by the enigmatic life of SCP-073, also known as Kane. This piece features a person named Bluebird buying a jar containing Kane's memories from a merchant, possibly affiliated with Marshall Carter and Dark Limited. It is a complex tale concerning many small fragments from Kane's life, thousands of years in the past. Here is a brief excerpt. The man found Cain, Ben Adam, in the endless wilderness of the Between Places. The man was beautiful to look upon, with bronze skin and shaggy black hair. His clothing was cut of animal skin, of fashions pleasing to the eye. But Cain was not pleased to see him. The man knew his name. I am a priest, the man said. A year ago you passed through my village. I wished to follow you then, but I was held back by the others. Then the crop failed and a plague swept through our village. Only I was able to save myself, and then there were none to hold me back. I have searched for you since, and now I have finally found you." Cain frowned. He tried to wander only those lands where the soil was wild and suffused with power enough to resist his curse, or else lands where the inhabitants knew how to refresh the land which his curse had made barren. When he needed to pass through civilization, he avoided the fields. He had long ago discovered that his curse had a limit, 48 cubits around him, or a length similar to 12 times his own height, enough to judge with the naked eye. But that did not account for the times he was not fully aware. Often taken with wanderlust, sometimes not even fully awake, he would walk in a trance according to where his feet took him alone. After these periods, he could awake having destroyed the entire harvest for a village. I am truly sorry, Cain said. The man looked astonished. You are Cain, the wanderer, father of the lost children and the great beasts. You are the god of death. The other gods, the lesser gods, could not save my village. I worshipped them once. I despise them now. I come now to worship you. They were your family, Cain said. Even if they were not, I cannot be pleased about bringing more death to those who did not deserve it. You are testing me, my lord, the man's teeth gleamed. I promise you, I will not disappoint you. I will become your follower and your priest. Foolish, Cain said and continued walking. The man followed him. It is clear that the curse Cain is forced to carry since committing the terrible sin of murder against his own brother weighs heavily upon him, and the powers he possesses now are both a blessing and a terrible detriment to the normal life he would have led. As with anything involving Cain, it is a deeply tragic tale. Next comes another insight into a normally secretive world, a piece entitled The Exhibition, written by an aspiring anarchist named Artifacts. The piece details his frustrating experience hosting his artwork at a private exhibition hosted by the sinister members of Marshall Carter and Dark Limited. And of course, here is a brief extract. I had never been so disappointed before. Tonight was supposed to be my big night, the an art exhibition that would have defined my career, hosted by the richest men of the anomalous world, Marshall Carter and Dark. Luminaries from all across the multiverse had come to see our work. 
I remember how surprised and excited I was to see the letter that I had even been accepted into the exhibition. To receive one of these had been my dream since I was a child, learning about all the wonders of the anomalous on my father's knee. How oh, the letter looked so formal with the logo of M, C, and D printed at the bottom that I thought it sealed my future forever. I spent five hours fretting beforehand. I eventually settled on a suit to wear, a black and white chessboard pattern only with actual chess pieces that moved and played games over the fabric. I had specifically requested that it be made with some of the most famous games of history sewn into it. When I looked down at myself, I could not tell which game was which. Before I could second guess my choice of clothing, I looked at the time and realized that I was running slightly late and left in a hurry, rushing to the portal that the letter told me to go, in between a bookshop and a bowling alley. When I arrived, my astonishment at seeing the place was a feeling I would never forget. It was ridiculously surreal, like if M.C. Escher painted an art museum, and the museum was filled with Escher's paintings with the paintings themselves being alive. Oh, the chandeliers were made from glowing crystals, almost looking more like disco balls than chandeliers. The crowd there was as impressive as the art, with all sorts of people from all sorts of dimensions dressed in the finest suits, capes, and cloaks that money could buy. As I approached the host, a tall, imposing figure with gray robes, a metal mask, and a mane of white hair. I felt very intimidated. Yes, yes. I've been awaiting your arrival, Natura. He was saying to a woman before him, a human with a green dress that I would quickly notice was actually made out of leaves, and dark green hair to match flowing down past her shoulders, with flowers in her hair and clothes. Your work is waiting for you in the West Wing. The woman, who I assumed was named Natura, eagerly nodded and looked over to her right. She started walking so quickly she almost bumped into me. The night didn't go much better for Artifix after that. His NR pieces were a painting of a woman who makes you fall in love, a vase that kills anything put inside of it, and a little statue of an archer who fires real arrows. The representatives of Marshall Carter and Dark were not impressed by this meager display leaving Artifex, who'd mainly gotten in from his father's business connections, feeling, well, let's say, less than stoked. But the Wanderer's Library isn't all just technical documents and prose. There's also a fair share of spellbinding poetry in these dusty old pages. Take, for example, Stars Wade for No Man, by the illustrious poet who goes only by Dr. Pan. It is a powerful and melancholy piece presented here in full. The abyss is an infinitude, unknown and unknowable. Creatures with mouths over throats seek insight into their existence, gazing at that which only gazes back. They choke as they look, windpipes bent awkwardly, tears trickling from their eyes, windows reflecting, a goal unachievable. Eyes peer into darkness, searching for more and more, yearning, hoping, desiring, but not doing, never going, weeping at the beauty beyond reach. A number tried, reaching out to the void, but the other scoffed, drowning the door with tears, all while they rested, their asses in the dirt. An eternity separates that which seeks and that which is sought. Eternity only grows as they gaze on, dreaming, but not doing. Stars wait for no man. The Wanderer's Library is a truly fascinating place, with so much strange beauty and arcane knowledge to gather up and learn. Would you like us to cover more of the many esoteric volumes in the library's infinite shelves? Let us know down in the comments. And we thoroughly recommend you check out all the full tales in the library itself using the link in the description. Just be careful when you do so. It is so very easy to get lost in there. Now go check out SCP-6000, The Serpent, The Moose, and The Wanderer's Library, and SCP Serpent's Hand Explained for more on the legendary library between dimensions.